We are so glad you decided to join us this morning online. Uh, we really just want to connect with anyone that, that's watching this, and so we wanted to make sure to point out two main important things, ways you can know what's going on at TFBC. First off, you could always go to our website, tulariefbc.org. Uh, you could find different events, uh, learn a little bit about our church, what we believe, our staff, all those things. You can find that on our church website. So please make sure you check that out. But really the best way to stay connected with everything we have going on is to simply download the Tulare First Baptist Church app. So if you go on the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, you should be able to find it. And through the app, we, we do have an events page. Again, all of our events are right there. Uh, there's ways to, to sign up for different events we have on there. There's ways to connect with us, such as just reaching out to the church office. Uh, it does have ways to call us, but also just message us through the app. Uh, we also do have, you can read the Bible through our app and there's times we have different Bible reading plans. Uh, sometimes they actually coincide with the sermon series. Just a lot of great things on that app. We would not want you to miss out with what we have there. So please make sure you download that and just make sure you connect with us in some way. Uh, obviously it is harder to connect with you through just the video. So we would love for you to reach out and just let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we can minister to you in any way possible. I'm excited to get to hear the message this morning and, and to see what God has to teach us. So good to see you in the Lord's house as we begin a new week together. And as Pastor Matt just prayed, talking about us becoming more like Christ. How many of you know this past week, whether you realize it or not, God can use any circumstance to make us more like Christ. And some of you may have even discovered while you were filling up your vehicle with either gas or diesel, and you might have thought, maybe I could just start walking everywhere instead of driving and just in that thought, you were moving in a direction to become more like Christ. So, wow, that's not funny, is it? Uh, yeah, I don't know about you. I was filling up my car with fuel this past week and uh, watching that thing spin like crazy. And I uh, felt like I had a few symptoms of uh, coronavirus. Uh, car owner virus. Car, car owner virus. Um, anyway, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I can just tell this is not a day for humor, not on your part, on my part. Let's just move on. Message entitled, Worthy Together. That's what the church is. And as we've been talking about going through the book of Ephesians, if you were here in past weeks, you know I mentioned that the first three chapters we might consider more theological and uh, kind of to, to get, lay the framework of who we are as a church, and that's the idea of we need to embrace that. We need to embrace who we are as the people of God, as the church, and then the last three chapters really get very practical about then how do you engage the mission that God's called us to once you embrace who we are, and we talk about it in terms of together. Remember in, in the church at Ephesus, God is working to bring together Jew and Gentile, and they have very different experiences in life. They see the world differently, and I think we can appreciate that, especially having recently come out of the, the pandemic in the last couple of years we've experienced. Uh, we all have a realization that what we experienced caused us to see things very differently, and we have our opinions, we have our, our thoughts, we can have very strong opinions about that, nothing necessarily wrong with that. The idea is, though, is your opinion about some matter more important than Christ building his kingdom? And we're going to learn a little bit more of that today and what it means to acknowledge that it is God through Christ who's working to bring us together to be the church. And uh, let me just say, uh, I think because we're in ag country here, there's so many of these things we can understand, I think, so much better. But when we think about defining the church so that we don't just use these terms loosely, the church is God working to put Christ on display, all right? So you say, well, what does that mean, putting Christ on display? Well, World Ag Expo, right? We understand that. Most of you have probably been to the World Ag Expo, even if you just went there to get a tri-tip sandwich or something, right? I mean, you, you, you know the World Ag Expo. And, and basically, the World Ag Expo 
is the time where ag is put on display, right? And, and you walk out there, and all of a sudden you realize, you start walking around that grounds, and you're like, oh my gosh, I never even thought about how so much of this is connected to ag, that this is a fuller expression of agriculture in all various aspects. Now, if you can picture that, and if you experience that, it gives us, I think, a little, uh, we're a little ahead of maybe the rest of the country in understanding God's definition of the church. The church is simply putting Christ on display. And when we really get a full picture of that, we begin to understand the manifold wisdom of God. So that's another term we're going to bump into as we move through this passage. Let's begin in verse 14 of chapter 3. This is where Paul begins to turn a little bit, right? So he's starting now to turn as we head toward chapter 4. And keep in mind, remember, we put these chapters and verse numbers in later. Paul's simply writing. We're about halfway through his letter, and now he's making this turn from embracing who we are to engaging what God's called us to do. So he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father. Interesting. He's giving a picture. He's saying to the church, For this reason I'm praying. This should take us, if you're familiar with Scripture, you go back to John chapter 17, we get a picture of Jesus praying. And he's praying, if you go back and read that, wonderful chapter to read, Jesus is praying for the church to be one. He's praying for unity. In his church, John 17, go back and read that prayer this week sometime in your study. So Paul's picking up that same kind of picture and he's saying, I kneel before the Father, just like Jesus did, and I'm praying for the church from every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. All right, before we jump into the prayer more deeply. And again, I would encourage you to spend time with that prayer in this coming week. Let's step back. For this reason, let's define some things. What's the reason? We need to be clear. Paul's saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father and pray. What's the reason? Well, the reason, as we're just told in earlier verses, that God's intent is through the church to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Remember we talked last week about there's something, we can't fully understand it, but there's something in a spiritual realm, heavenly realms, spiritual warfare. You know, Paul's going to get to that later in chapter 6 when he talks to us about put on the full armor of God because your battles are not against flesh and blood. We're going to get, we're going to, get to that. But he's already foreshadowing the idea that there's something happening in spiritual realms. So for example, to be current, we're all, I would assume, I, I would imagine every one of us are aware that there is a war going on in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, right? You can't, you can't really miss that. That's happening. It's affecting a lot of things, impacting our lives in a lot of ways, impacting the world. And what Paul's simply saying is you can try to define what's happening there in physical terms. Nothing wrong with that analyze what's happening, various leaders and decisions they're making and why they're making, or you can also then pull back and recognize that there's something going on at a spiritual level. And I would suggest to you, wisdom would tell us, begin to recognize and think in terms of these kinds of things are not just playing out here, but there's something going on in the spiritual realm. We can't fully understand it, but Paul gives us some introduction to it here. He gives us, kind of opens a window and lets us see a little bit of the important role the church plays in this unfolding of whatever's happening in the world. It's according to God's eternal purpose and what He has accomplished in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I pray, being rooted and established in love, that you may have power, and then here's that key word, together, he's saying your power is going to come from unity. Your power is going to come from being together, a diverse people that God has brought into one body, the Lord's holy people. So you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love. And by the way, this sometimes... Uh, where we get in trouble. To know this love, this word know, gnosko, means to know from experience. 
All right? So let me, let me just see if we can play this a little bit. How many single people we got here? As single folks, we're glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How many have never been married before? Those of you who have never been married, thank you for being here too. Can we agree that if you've never been married and you were to get married, or those of us who are married, not that it's a bad thing, right? But those of us who are married could say, uh, there's some things you might not know. Are you with me? Until what? Until you get married, right? Once you experience marriage, again, don't, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. I've been blessed in a wonderful marriage for many years. I'm just saying there's things you learn that you can only know from experiencing it. All right, let's try another one. That one moved in help. How, how many moms we got in here? We got Mother's Day coming up. All right, you moms who've given birth. Anybody know where this train's headed? <laughs> can we men... <laughs> can we men understand childbirth? Why? Because we haven't experienced it. Now, we celebrated our oldest daughter, Rebecca's birthday this past week, and I was picking at Luann. I said, you remember this day, how tough it was on me all those years ago? <laughs> I want you to know I didn't get a lot of sympathy, did I? Nah. All I'm trying to say is, Paul's saying, I want you, I'm praying that you come to know this love because you've experienced it. Because until you've experienced it, until you've experienced it, the church will never make sense, ever, which is why the world more and more is going to look at the church, and they're not going to understand it, and they're going to mock it and be critical of it because they're not going to understand because until you've experienced the love of Christ, that transformative Love of Christ, it does not make sense. Paul says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He's praying that the church would experience the depth of God's love. And friends, I can just tell you, my hunch is most of us have only experienced so little of God's love. Those of you who've gone through greater challenge, greater loss, can give testimony to a greater degree about the ways in which God shows up and His love sustains you, His grace, His mercy in those difficult moments of life. The manifold wisdom of God. I want to try to define this again. Now, keep in mind, even as I say this, I don't want to be uh, you know, so arrogant as to assume that I can fully tell you what the manifold wisdom of God is. You realize how ridiculous that'd be. That's God's manifold wisdom. It goes beyond any kind of way that we can try to grasp it. But what Paul's giving us insight to here is what he's saying, I think, is the manifold wisdom of God. And that it's being revealed in the spiritual heavenly realms, in the spiritual forces and all that's going on in the spiritual realm. That what God is revealing in and through His church is the power of the transformative love of God. That God in love and through love can take people who are so diverse and through love can turn them into the body of Christ. Christ, the presence of Christ, the power of Christ, the work of Christ on earth in the church. And it seems to me that the, some, some of those evil forces in the heavenly realms are saying, they ain't no way. That ain't gonna happen. Evil will prevail every time. People are selfish. They're self-centered. They're going to do me, 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 me. That's what they seem to be saying to God. 
That's what's going to happen. And you are crazy if you think that people will die to self and think of others and sacrifice and serve others. The heavenly realms seem to be saying, no way. And God is saying, watch me. Watch me. I'm going to work through my spirit, through the church, and I'm going to show you what the manifold wisdom of God looks like. Love prevails. Love transforms. Love causes people to act in ways that may not make sense to the world. Remember, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. So let's go back to moms again. To the world. And we see this played out in certain pockets. To the world. Tell a woman. You're going to get pregnant. It's going to send your hormones crazy and cause your body to go through all kinds of crazy things. And you're going to be in that condition for nine months. The last three or four really getting testy. <laughs> and then you're going to go into this thing called labor. And you're going to give birth. And it's going to be painful. Well, until they start giving all those meds. But anyway, that's another story, right? Luann was giving birth our last child. They had a, they, she was all, what is that, epidural thing, whatever. I told the doctors, came in. They had to tell Luann when the contractions were happening, right? They said, they were looking at this machine and said, okay, push now. I said, something ain't right about this. I'm reading the scripture here. I trust you, nobody wanted to hear God's word in that moment. So, You're going to experience pain. And then after that child is born, what are you going to do, Mom? What are you going to do? You're going to love that child. You know why we celebrate Mother's Day? Because it's worth celebrating. Because that is just one glimpse of the manifold wisdom of God and how God chooses to show love wins. Because you can't really explain that, can you? Why? Why would you love? And I think that's why some ways we look to moms and we recognize there's something, there's a reflection. We get a, we get a glimpse of the heart and love of God and the way moms can love. Paul says in this passage, that he wants the church to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Worthy. You talk about raising the bar. He's already tried to establish in these first three chapters, this is who you are as a church. This is what church means. This is why it's important. There's something going on in the heavenly realms, and, and, and God is using the church, showing through the church His power to transform lives because of love. And then Paul, it's as if having said all that, he turns and he says, Church, I want you to live in a manner worthy of your calling. Embrace the calling of who you are as part of the church, and begin to live in a manner worthy, consistent with who you are. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, it's about being, and even says, I, I, I pray that you be completely humble. That's verse 2, chapter 4. Be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. I'm not sure we're ready for this. You ready for this? I mean, you do want me to present the Word of God, right? Sure. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Based on the last two years, we could spend months on that one verse. May, are you kidding? Make every effort? What does it mean to make every effort? It means you learn. That there's a time to be silent, and there's a time to speak. 
I'm just here to tell you, <laughs> there's evidence out there that we still need to learn that. We're not good at it. But pastor, if we don't do these things, are you telling me that you don't believe God is in control at some point? He can take care of that stuff? You see, sometimes the things we want to fix in our strength, we can't fix in our strength. And the things that we can do to help hold the Spirit in the bond of peace, well, we don't care about those things. I'd rather spend my time trying to fix that which is out of my control. God says, who do you really think you are, right? I mean, how many of you think that with a... Are you ready? A social media post, I'm going to fix this problem. How many of you will believe that? Huh? But pastor, I need people to know. What you need them to know is that you are living a life worthy of the calling that you've received. You see, we're called to be different, which means we've got to understand the importance of of what God wants. The church is divided because instead of being focused on Christ, we're all focused on what I want. Jew and Gentile could never come together until they learned that what God wants for His church is more important than what either side wants for themselves. I think I could say many times the world is critical of the church because they've never really seen it. Not from God's perspective. Not His intent for the church. Same with marriage. We see a world very critical of marriage nowadays. It has no use for marriage. And I would say it's largely because they've not seen marriage lived out as God intended and I think the same could be said of the church. So often, we're not looking like the church. It's about being. Now look at this list. Being humble, being gentle, being patient, being forgiving, being loving, being peacemakers. How many of you want to step up and just check those off? Say, well, I look at my relationships, check, 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 check. I got all those. <laughs> That's the bar. Unless you go out of here thinking, okay, he's giving me a list, now I've got to go check all these off. Let's see, I'm going to go find a place to be patient this week, and I'll find a place to be humble. No, that's not what he's saying. If you look at that list, and then compare it in Galatians 5 to the fruit of the Spirit, you're going to discover something. They match up pretty well. What Paul's simply saying is, pray for the Spirit to continue to do a work in you so that you can produce the fruit of the Spirit. And when you begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit, or God produces that in you and through you, you will discover that you are able to be completely humble and gentle, patient, forgiving, peacemakers. God has called His church to put on display Christ. All right. Beep, 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 beep. You know what's happening, right? I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to back this truck up and drop it in a real practical place in your world. Where, from God's perspective, do you think He wants to display Christ in your life right now? Let God get real with you. My hunch is it's going to be an area that you feel like, I don't know what to do. And maybe you've even prayed about it. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know why this has happened. I don't know why I'm being treated this way. I don't know why this relationship is the way it is. I, God, help me. 
And I think he says to us, for eternal purposes, if you want to know his reasoning, he whispers, display Christ. And we're like, huh, no, that won't work. Uh, God, you got anything else? (laughs) Hear me. When you say with confidence that God's plan won't work while at the same time believing yours will, who did you just make God? And what does it mean for us to be the people of God? A people who believe vengeance is mine saith the offended person, right? No, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He's saying, you do your part, I'll do my part. But God, what's my part? Display Christ. Don't miss an opportunity to become more like Christ. Next question. Is there any place in your life, in your relationships, where in this moment as you sit in God's house, that you could entertain the thought that maybe God could do a work and accomplish His purpose if you could be humble, gentle, patient, forgiving, loving, and a peacemaker? Any place that has application in your life? Any place at all that you could even entertain the thought as you sat here in God's house to say, if I were to try to go out here and do that because God's Spirit is working in me, transforming me, if I were to go out here and put Christ on display in one of those ways or all of those ways, could God work out a situation I've been struggling with? Just a thought. Second part, if we're going to live a life worthy of calling, I think it involves being those things because we're walking with the Spirit, we're producing the fruit of the Spirit. Secondly, it's because we're building up the body of Christ. Building up the body of Christ. And let me just stop here a minute and say, for all of you who serve, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for all the ways you serve. We have security team people out there who right now are standing watch so we don't have to be concerned that somehow we're going to get surprised without somebody at least being on the front line looking out for us. You may not know this, but there's also people walking through the parking lot right now to make sure nobody's bothering your vehicle and your stuff and your cars. There were people who got here early and provided coffee for you and were ready to give it to you with a smile on this cool day, the first day of spring, huh? Isn't that nice? Aren't we thankful for those folks? There were people who even got here early and they set up all that to make an environment very welcoming for you as you came in. People who serve. And it's not just on Sunday morning. There's people who lead community groups. There's people who serve in children's ministry today and midweek. And there's people serving and Monday nights and celebrate recovery. There's people serving with our mops ministry. All kinds of ways. And I simply say, and I can't list them all, but I say, thank you for serving. Because here's what I've learned in all my years of pastoring. A church's strength is not measured by their seating capacity. It is measured by our serving capacity. And if we're going to understand what Paul's teaching here, he's talking about the church growing up. How many of you have lived more than 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? How many of you know that as you get older and you live life, you gain some experience? That if a younger person were to tell you, 
Experience counts for nothing. But you could just smile and say, hmm, I'll pray for you. You know, you don't say it out loud, just, right? Because at some level we realize with growing up, you start seeing things more clearly. You understand things. I've said to you before, one of the things that I've done in the past, I just have to confess to God. I used to think I could build the church through flesh giving birth to spirit. Meaning you try to coax people in and convince them and try to get folks to serve and they're still living in the flesh. And what I've learned through experience is, God forgive me for that, flesh never gives birth to spirit. Only spirit can give birth to spirit. Jesus said that. So the people we want serving, let me be very clear, are only those who know what it is to, first of all, experience the love of Christ. Because until the love of Christ has transformed your heart, the only way you'll ever serve is somebody manipulating you or making you feel guilty. They do that in secular culture all the time, whether your kids are in sports or little league. You know how that works. That game's played out. And they'll try to manipulate and get you to sell candy you don't want to sell. And you're like, ah, gee, what do I do? You know, they, they just, because, you, you know, you have to do this. That's not what church is about. That's not the manifold wisdom of God. What God's talking about is His love will so transform a heart that people will do it out of love and i just believe in all my heart that all the evil forces in the heavenly realms are saying no way god you don't know how selfish and self-centered these people are you don't know how we can keep them so distracted and pulled up in their own stuff god it won't work and god sits back and says watch watch and see what I can do through the church. Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Here's what Paul's saying. Let me do this quickly. You cannot attain the full measure of what God wants to do in your life until you learn to serve others period. You will never know the full measure of what God wants to do till you come to know your spiritual gift. God, what have you gifted me to do? What is it that I can do that brings a blessing to others? When Ty stands over here and plays this thing, I promise you, if I pick it up and play it right now, not only will I not be Ty's friend any longer, but no, it'll sound terrible because he has an ability but it's not just an ability, not just a musical talent and ability, but he also has a gift. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That when he plays that for God, God can use it to bless others and move people. Now, I'm not trying to lift up Ty in this moment. What I'm trying to say is you need to understand that if you're a follower of Christ, that the Spirit of God dwells in you, you have the same kind of gift. Now, maybe it's not playing a horn, but you have a gift that when you do it, God blesses other people. Do you know what it is? And most of the church in America would say no. And that's why we introduce things like this shape assessment. That's not my gift. <laughs> and I have to apologize in some ways. This came across very confusing. I'll own that. Because what people seem to take from this shape assessment is I'm going to answer some questions, take a test, and it's going to spit out and tell me what my spiritual gift is. To the degree that you thought that, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's on me. Let me be clear. I don't believe, because we're talking about God now, I don't believe there's any way that there's ever a test, any test, that you're going to take and tell you exactly what your spiritual gift is. That's not how it works. Partly because I think sometimes we would do that and we would say, okay, God, tell me what my gift is, and then I'll tell you whether I want to do it. That would have been like me years ago. God, tell me that you want to call me to preach in Tulare, and then I'll tell you whether I'm willing to do it. And just to give you a little hint, had he told me that years ago, I would have probably said no. I, first, I would have said, Tulare, where? And then I would have said no. <laughs> but that's not how he did it. Maybe it'll help if I just tell you a little bit about 
how my calling to preach came about. I was out of high school, and I was working at Kentucky Fried Chicken. How many of you know that when you're working at Kentucky Fried Chicken right out of high school, you want something else? <laughs> That's all you need to know. It's like, I just want some. I'm tired of smelling like 13 original herbs and spices. I want something else. So there's this gospel singing group, the Gloryland Singers, came through our church. We got to know their relationship. And they needed a bass guitar player. And I said, I could do that. I'd never picked up a bass guitar in my life, but I, you know, what, what young person doesn't think they could do anything, right? I can do that. And so I went and took some bass guitar lessons. And then I went to South Carolina, where they were based out of, and I said, here I am, your bass guitar player. I traveled with them for a while, and I'm going to guess, I don't know this, I'm going to guess that Alan, the leader of the group, said, how do we tell him he's not a bass guitar player? <laughs> so one day, we were about 30, 45 minutes out. On a Sunday, we had sung at a church that Sunday morning. We had another singing that night, but we were stopping at a nursing home on a Sunday afternoon to play for this nursing home. We're about 30, 45 minutes out. Alan, the leader, says to me, Bobby, I want you to share a devotion, a word today at the nursing home. I was like, what? You want me to what? He said, just five, ten minutes. Share something at the nursing home. Open the word of God and share from God's word. I went on the back of the bus. I'm back there, oh my God. I'm stra- oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I went to John 14. I told him everything I knew and a lot of things I wasn't too sure about. And I sat down, and then the group played. We get on the bus. I said, Alan, why did you do that? I mean, I felt like it was a disaster. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I said, why did you do that? And here's what he said. I feel like God's calling you to preach. I see it in you. And I figured there in that nursing home, most of those people can't hear. (laughs) And the ones that did hear you, they were very gracious and forgiving at that point. I thought it was a good place for you to start. And now, all these years later, I'm standing in front of you, and you're all looking at me as if I was supposed to have something to say. And I don't have anything other than a few bad jokes in God's Word. <laughs> the way you find your spiritual gift, what this assessment can help you with is simply helping you get on paper some of your experiences because sometimes we don't always think about it. So the questions help you think about some of the ways you've experienced things. Because remember, God doesn't waste anything. He'll use every aspect of your life in some way. It's part of your shape. So you need to get it on paper in front of you so you understand what have been some significant experiences in your life. What are things you're passionate about? It'll help you see your heart. It'll help you understand the things you care about, that you're passionate about, that God placed in your heart. We don't all care about the same things, but because God places different things in our heart within the body of Christ, all the things God cares about get put on display. This will help you find what those things are. But the only way you're ever going to know your spiritual gift is by stepping into a place and start to serve. And when you serve, you'll begin to discover, just like I did at Kentucky Fried Chicken, well, I don't want to do that, right? And you'll find those certain things like, oh, that didn't work for me. And you just keep praying. Let me tell you how, equipping looks like this. Praying, 
getting you in the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says the Word of God is profitable for teaching and equipping. That's why we try to get you in the Word. Because it's the Word of God working with the Spirit of God, that's why you pray, that will help reveal to you the plan of God, particularly for your life, and how God wants to use your shape, your giftedness, your ability. And here's the key. To bless others. I want to be very clear on this, and I don't want to confuse anybody. What Paul's trying to say here when he talks about how God called him to be the leader for the Gentiles, him being a Jew, helping bring the Gentiles in, he says, this is the gift that God's given me for you. Be very clear. I think I can honestly say, were it not for God's calling on my life, we would not be in California today. It was never part of our plan, never something we thought that we would do. It was God's plan, and now I see it more clearly having trusted Him and taken these steps. I understand more what He had in mind. There's a lot of facets to it. But I'm simply saying, we came to California for others. You got to know when you're in the Midwest, California looks like a huge mission field, <laughs> a foreign country. They told me when I left, they were sending Bob to the foreign mission field. Building up the body of Christ is about doing things for others. Now, when you do that, and again, the only reason we do that, that's the manifold wisdom of God being displayed, is because God's love has so transformed your heart that out of that love, you will do for others. Again, let's go back to moms. You get up in the middle of the night, you lose sleep, you go take care of that baby, you change that baby, you all these things. Why? Why would you do that? Moms could answer it in one word, right? Love. Because somehow in that miracle, God changes your heart, transforms the heart, and you care about others. That's a picture of what God wants to do in all of our lives in the sense that once the the love of Christ transforms you, it changes how you see other people. You never see them the same. And you're willing to give of yourself to serve others. So how do you find your spiritual gift? Pray, get in the Word, and step into some kind of ministry. That's why we have all kinds of beginning points. In fact, if you have your phones with you, if you, uh, those of you who have the app, if you don't have the app, go ahead and download the app. But if you have the app, go to the app. You don't have to right now, but sometime this week. If you go to the app, you'll see a place on there called Serve. There's a button. It couldn't be any easier. You just push the Serve button, and when you do, it's going to bring up Serving Opportunities. And there's tons of them. I mentioned the security team, people who just serve at a service and take, make sure everybody else is being. So why would you stay longer on this campus and not just get in your car and go home? Because you love God and you love others. You're willing to say, what can I do to help the body of Christ grow? And you stick around and you begin to step into serving opportunities. So there's a welcome home team. I'll just start. That's the first one. So if you push the button for welcome home team, there's a whole list of positions. There's a connect cart Uh, coffee, pastry counter, greeters, ushers, security team, setup team, all kinds of things there. You can say, where could I step in? Most of those places, I mean, you don't have to know all the Bible. You don't have to know the Old Testament to serve coffee. You only have to know the New Testament, and particularly one book, Hebrews. Okay. I told you, bad jokes in the Word of God. That's all you're going to get. If you're expecting more, all kinds of ways. Here's the thing. The church cannot grow up and be the full expression of God until everybody's doing their part. That's what Paul's saying here. He gets very practical. Every part 
It's about becoming mature as the body of Christ. Notice Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of, of Him who is the head, that is Christ. Now think about this. How in the world can we really, in every respect, become the full expression of God, of Christ in the world? Is that even possible? As you ponder that question, I believe God gives you a glimpse into the heavenly realms. And he says, well, let's talk about it. The evil spiritual forces say no, not possible. Why? Because people are selfish and self-centered and they only want what they want. It'll never happen, God. But God says it will happen. Through the manifold wisdom of God, the church begins to reflect the fullness of Christ. How? From Him, Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love how somebody say those last five words with me all right let's try it again all right one more time now you're primed and ready from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love are you ready your part You say, the pastor, I'm just going to sit here until I know exactly what my work is. Step in. Just get started. If it's not working out for you, our promise is this. We'll get you out of there. Don't have this fear that, oh, I'm going to get stuck with a bunch of fourth grade boys and I can't get out. <laughs> no, we would not do that to you. That's what the devil does to you. We don't do that. <laughs> Just step in. Because here's where we miss a very important part. I'm almost done, so hang with me. We think, again, we've bought into the lie of the devil. We think when you serve, the only people who benefit are those being served. That's an American mindset, and we've bought it. I think what God wants to say to us very clearly what does it mean to grow up in every respect to reflect Christ it means everybody lean in a little bit I'm getting ready to tell you something important just lean in just a little bit it means there are people in the church you need to get to know and that relationship is going to be a blessing to you in the Ephesian church it was Jew and Gentile right and part of what Paul's saying is if you're going to understand what God's doing you got to get to know the Gentiles Jews and Jews you got to get to know the Gentiles it's not just the serving. He's saying as you work together, as you unify around the mission God's called us to, you're going to find yourself in relationship with people who don't always agree with you. Let me get practical. When you come to church, who do you tend to hang out with and talk to? Who? The people who pretty much agree with you. You find yourself very seldom in question and conversation. You know that and you're drawn to them. That's the people you know are like you. What Paul is revealing to us and help us understand is for the fullness of God to be lived out in us, you've got to get to know some people you don't know right now. How are you going to get to know them? Step into these positions of serving. It will open the door for some new relationships. Missy, I see you smiling. Can I pick on you a minute? For those of you, especially you ladies, Missy Ashford, Again, I know you hate me for this, and I'm going to get in trouble. Missy Ashford serves the Lord in so many ways in our church. 
very gifted, very gifted. And one of the joys that I get to see when Missy and I talk sometimes through the week, she drops by to help out and serve in another capacity, as I love to hear her tell about the people you're meeting, the people, she'll say, God's bringing some people, some women into a Bible study that I would have never met otherwise. And Missy, is it not a blessing to you? God has people he wants to bring into your life that you need to meet. That in your circles, you're never going to meet them. Jews would hang out with Jews. Gentiles hung out with Gentiles. Unless somehow God could bring them together and break down those dividing walls, they would have never met one another. But when they did, they often found their best friend. One of the reasons God wants us to trust Him in this is so we can begin to grow up in the fullness of Christ and some of that fullness is going to be reflected in the relationships of people that we don't know right now. Meaning, until you get to know some of these folks, your life cannot be as full as God wants it to be. He's going to fill your life with some blessing And it's on the other side of something that the enemy has convinced you that's the worst thing in the world. Don't do that. It's a trap. Run. And that's the dilemma. But here's what I know. If you pray about it and you keep taking steps, you'll come to discover your reason to serve is not what the pastor's preaching about. It ultimately comes down to the Spirit of God in you doing a work because Christ first loved you. And you say, what do I do with this? I need to do something. And we begin to trust God. Let me give you a quick discipleship process. You see it there at the bottom. Please understand, people don't go in this, it's not like this perfect thing, but I just want you to see how you grow as a disciple. Real quickly, I first come to understand God loves me. For God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son. It's the only verse I need to know, John 3, 16. I understand that God loves me. Some of you, that's where you are, and we celebrate with you that you are coming to know the love of God in your life, that God loves you. And if you'd like to take a step and profess faith in Christ and and be baptized, we welcome you, we want to pray with you, we're here for you. That's the first step, coming to realize God loves me. Step two. At some point, don't know how long it'll be, but then I come to realize the love of God is changing me, and I want to reciprocate that love. I want to show my love for God. And we do that through worship attendance, what you're doing today. You're primarily here because of your love for God. You begin to give. Many of you, you start giving. Maybe it's the first time, and you're supporting the ministries of the church It's a way of expressing your love for God. You're saying, God loves me. He's blessed me. I want to show my love for God. That's growth. Maturity. Next step, I begin to connect. Now, the difference here is if I'm over here, I can still celebrate that God loves me and that I love God, but as soon as church is over, I am out of here, right? Because I don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to meet anybody. I'm, not, I'm just, I'm here because I love God, God loves me, and I want to get out of here. And it's a race to the parking lot. Until someday, as you grow, you begin to connect. You stop long enough to have some conversation with people. Maybe you see somebody you know, your neighbor, somebody you work with. Out of community. All of a sudden, you start having some conversation. And you begin to connect with other believers. Maybe you join a community group or you go to a Bible study and you start connecting with these other believers and you say, man, this is cool. I like this. It's helpful to have people who pray for you. It's helpful to study the word with other people. I would have never got that on my own, but I studied, man, I see things I didn't see before. This is great. I am connected to the other believers. And this is where we miss it because we often say, I'm getting connected to the church but I'm going to tell you 
just studying the Bible with other believers is not necessarily a connection with the church. That's a growth step. That's the one we're talking about right now. Is when you realize, wait, I'm not just connected to other believers. I'm connected to the body of Christ. I'm connected to the church, something much larger than me. Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize it. And that's where the Spirit of God, as we grow in that way, helps us see, oh, wait a second. I thought I was just here for me. I had a consumer mindset. I was shopping for a church that was about me and met my needs and what I wanted. And all of a sudden, God helped me see, wait, 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 God, are you serious? It's not about me? Now, folks, I cannot overemphasize the importance of that growth step. That is like your kids. You know, when you're younger, your kids think, your kids think it's all about them, right? And then your kids reach an age where they realize you can have fun without them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And your kids are almost shocked. Like, they think when they leave home, you're going to be devastated. Do you have nothing to do? And, and, and when our last kid moved out, we're like high-fiving. Yeah, baby! <laughs> All right! How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'll pray for you parents who still have kids at home. All right. I'm just saying, when you're a kid, you can sometimes believe something that's not true. But as you mature and as you grow and experience things, you all of a sudden realize, wait a second. Church isn't about me. It's about me being a part of God's plan to reveal His wisdom in the spiritually realms. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. And when you get that, you begin to care. Now, this is where the church gets criticized a lot because people in the world will say, you say all that stuff, you say you love us, but you, you don't care. And I got to tell you, many times the church is guilty of that because biblically speaking, you don't care until you get involved. And we got enough people in our culture who walk around and look at issues and say, oh, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. Somebody should do something, somebody should do something. And we just are critical, right? Well, you can throw out criticism and never care. Only pretend to care. When you really care, you say, I want to do something about that. How can I help? How can I get involved? And you begin to care in ministry. And when you find your mission... That's when you begin to better understand how God has shaped you, how God has gifted you, and now you are serving out of that, and God is blessing others. Friends, as best I can tell, that's what it looks like. That's what Paul's teaching. Are we ready to embrace who we are? As the church, from God's perspective? And are we ready to engage the purpose to which God has called us? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, the things it's teaching us. Thank you, God, for all who serve. I thank you for those who...